Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 5th, 2014. This is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, I really do mean it. We have a lot to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Might have to find me a new sponsor. And I use that word sponsor loosely because I hadn't got my sponsor checks in yet. Makers of Mountain Dew, which is PepsiCo, do not compensate me for this free endorsement. Red Bull said I was too fat. I actually, I did, I, you know, I, I joke about that every week, but I did contact them, and they uh, pretty much, pretty much said that. Oh, good stuff. Hey, there's a disclaimer screen. Let me sum it up for you. Make your life a little easier, or make your life not easier. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I just, um... It's funny. It's like right before this um, webinar started, I sold the stock, um, took some profits. Um, not bragged because it kind of got away from me. I could have took profits a lot higher, and I didn't follow my system exactly. So, who's to say that everybody else is doing what they should be doing exactly? Okay, so there are no exacts when it comes to the market. But I didn't let it get away from me. I made sure I locked in the profit while the profit was good, but. Um, it kind of take down from where I sold. So I'm not saying that I drove the price down, but I'm saying that, well, it's it did go down after I sold it. So you never know why somebody sold uh, or not. Technical analysis does help to lead the way, and there are some hard and fast rules when it comes to technical analysis uh, that, that do not occur in fundamental analysis. But anyway, I just got a little philosophical thinking that, hey, I just sold, and it's sort of going down. I mean, anybody could do that to you. It could be a hedge fund. In trouble, um, could be anything. Could be someone getting a divorce. People sell for a variety of reasons, and sometimes that selling begets more selling. So stuff happens. Okay. Hey, do me a favor, throw me a bone. If you read the book, if you like the book, I'm not sure why you'd be here because everything, or 99% of everything I talk about, comes from the book. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit about discretion in a few minutes, and that comes straight out of the layman's. I'm actually going to use some uh, graphics that I put into layman's there. Uh, but throw me a bone. And the reason I beg for reviews is um, every now and then you get a stinker up there. You'll get people that review the other reviews, which I don't understand. But I've complained enough about that in the past. Uh, you know what? Those or that slide is actually from last week. So let's just jump right into it. There's two things I want to talk about this week. I want to talk about discretion on stop nicks, and then I want to continue my discussion on IPOs. But before we get into IPOs, let's uh, talk about stop nicks. Now, as I said a second ago, a lot of the stuff in these webinars is straight from layman's, and um, this slide is actually in layman's. It's in the second half of layman's where I talk about using discretion. And sometimes you get in the market, and it begins to rally, and you tighten that stop up, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a tightening of the stop. Sometimes you just leave the stop where it is and the market will come down and hit it. But usually this is a more common case. The market begins to take off, kind of stalls out a little bit. And sometimes when it stalls out a little bit, it might come down and just barely hit that stop. Now I'm not saying if it does this, stay with the position. But sometimes if it just barely kind of nicks that stop, nick being the key word in that sentence, okay? If that trend begins to resume, then you stay with the position. Now, here's an example that happened a couple of days ago. Uh, I think the stop was at 14.30 on this, and it dropped about 13 cents below, which is not that big of a deal, um, 13 cents or so, on a $14 stock. And you can see it did sort of rally a little bit initially and came back in. But they won't always do this. Sometimes they'll just kind of keep dropping and then take off. Sometimes what happens is, the correction isn't finished. So you have a market that's going up and then it starts correcting and it looks like it's getting ready to take off, but then it comes back down and then it takes off again. Kind of like an ABC down and then takes off again. Um, but you can see that incrementally this is not much additional risk. Not that they'll always turn. You have to have some sort of uh, uncle point in mind and saying, okay, well, if it comes down to about right here, then I'm obviously wrong and then I'll get out. So this incremental risk, this extra little risk here, whether you get fortunate, it turns around, or unfortunate, and it comes down and hits your uncle point, 
And to those of you who are, who are uh, not foreign in here, but uh, who are non, um, uh, or from the States, I should say, uh, Uncle Point is a point of pain where you give up, you say uncle. It's like you, if you're being tortured, you give in and say, okay, enough, I quit, I'll, I'll talk. Um, so in the markets, when you have a stop that gets hit, or nicked, I should say, you have to have an uncle point in mind, just like if you were doing a damage control, you, you've already gotten the damage, but you have to be willing to uh, get out if it gets much, much worse and does not reverse, okay? So on a daily chart, you really can't, you can hardly even see it. In fact, that's one thing I'm going to reiterate in a few minutes when we get to the slides and the summary, is that you're better off if you are going to exercise a little discretion Look at a daily chart because this doesn't look like much, okay, on a daily chart. But when you're looking at it intraday, it can look a little bit scarier. And the stop was right here. And it kind of dropped through that, but then it stopped. And then on the next bar, you can see it came back up, and the next bar it reversed or continued the reversal. And then the stock took back off again. So a bit of a stop hunt um, underway, successful in, in finding our stops at least. And then the market takes off again. You know, one question that, that I'm asked is like, well, Dave, why didn't you set your stop right there? Okay. It's like, well, you don't know for sure. I thought right here would have been plenty enough room. I didn't think it would get past that. And it got just past that. So I was almost right on that. But it's like, but so you'd be surprised. Like sometimes I have a stop like at nine and it'll nick it and then take off again. Well, Dave, why didn't you set it at 859? It's like, well, if I knew for a fact that it would turn around before 859, then I would own the world. If you knew anything for a fact in this business, then you would own the world. I'm sorry about that. I had some um, take some glasses off. But yeah, again, if you knew anything for a fact, if markets were normally distributed, meaning they adhere to statistics, then you'd own the world. Um, but unfortunately, everybody else would know that too, like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker everybody knows that so if everybody if everybody knew if everyone knew that the markets were normally distributed and based on statistics then whoever had the biggest computers or the, the greatest statistical mind or knew the most about statistics would win uh, but there wouldn't be a market because everybody would uh, cancel everybody out you take a look at the casino in industry and, and their margins or between a half a percent and one percent, sometimes even less than that, depending on the game. And obviously a slot machine is another ball of wax altogether. But their margins aren't that big, and it's a multi-trillion dollar entry. Isn't the daily close that is important, not just intraday price move then that then recovers? Um, can you rephrase what you're saying? Uh, you can't. You can't wait for the close though, because you don't know where it's going to close. So let's say that it comes down here and hits your stop. Okay. You don't. You could say, well, let me just see where it closes, because this could happen to you. Okay. So at some point, again, you have to have that uncle point. But rephrase the question, and I'll, I'll be happy to address it. Now, one thing in here, I can't give you a set time frame. I know people who run a lot of money, um, and what will happen is if they get a stop hit, it's not like they won't honor the stop, but they'll give it 30 minutes to see if the market reverses. Now, here's the deal. They can't rush in with all of their shares anyway because in and of themselves, they might move the market. So that rule is a rule that's more institutionally oriented because it's going to take them a lot more than 30 minutes to sell their shares anyway. So they're not throwing caution to the wind. As an individual trader, a lot could happen in 30 minutes, and you're going to have to get out. You can't say, I'm going to wait 30 minutes. You can't even say, I'm going to wait five minutes. But if you could try to hang out a little while, and again, you've got that uncle point somewhere down here in mind, okay? But if you could try and hang out a little while, then in a case like this, this thing only dipped below for a minute. I actually didn't. I was keep. I keep a loose eye on the screen 
all day long. I'm not, a, I'm not asking you, nor do I suggest. In fact, we have a slide in this in one second. But I'm not suggesting you watch a screen all day. But maybe set an alarm, maybe somewhere in here or here or whatever, so you know that a little discretion might be necessary, and then take a look at things. But I didn't even notice that this thing dipped below the stop. Somebody was complaining because they got stopped out, and I'm like, what do you mean? The stop didn't hit, didn't get hit. It's traded above the stop. So this spike here was really quick, and it came right back up. So I'm not saying give it five minutes or ten minutes or one minute, but... If you could give it a little room and have that uncle point in mind, like a while back I had a client email me. He says, hey, this stock stops at uh, 15.75. You know, I'm going to let it go down to 15.25. I think 50 cents ain't going to kill me, right? It's not going to hurt me that bad. I've already got a loss. And then stock reversed and went on right back up. That was another one of those wild and crazy solar stocks. I think it was SCTY. It took off from there. So you've already got the loss. Um, and it's just a matter of whether or not you take it. And if the market keeps going through the stop, then you have to take it. You're forced to take it. But that incremental loss that you're going to have is not going to be enough to really mess up your system or mess up your day or mess up your year. It might aggravate you a little bit. But it's not going to mess up your year. And... If you catch a few big winners or if you have a stock turn around like this. Now, this one, hadn't, this one hadn't panned out yet, so this one might not be the best example ever. But, you know, me, I like to show live examples so they can play out so we can see what happens. And then hopefully a year from now we're still talking about this stock and I'm kind of beating a dead horse on it by staying with it. I don't know. Right now it's looking a little iffy. Who knows? But if you catch one or two trades that go back into the plus column and at least hit the initial profit target, it makes all the difference in the world. And if you catch one from a stock nick, meaning you stay with the stop nick, and it turns into an outlier, then you've paid for a lifetime of that additional risk by adding in. Okay. Now, there's always a trade-off in trading. There's nothing to say that you might not stay with the position the next day something really bad happens. Okay, That's trading. That's life. There's no guarantees. You want a guarantee, go out and buy yourself a toast. Okay. All right, Leon says, I answered the question. Excellent. Okay. What about selling half, selling the remaining half? Well, I thought about that too. But then you, you start, it's interesting you should say that because that's what that institution is going to start doing. If things don't pan out for that 30 minutes, they're going to start scaling out of that position. Uh, and into scaling, if they sell a little piece and all of a sudden the market comes roaring back, they're probably going to say, well, wait a minute. I guess we uh, we, we got lucky on that one. Uh, looks like the selling has exhausted itself. I think we'll stay with the position. But the only problem with that is I think you start making too many decisions and then everything gets sort of, sort of convoluted. I think you have to look at things from a very simplistic standpoint and say, what are we doing? We're either going to stay with this position or we're not. If we stay with it, there's a potential for us to be right big, but we also have an incremental loss, okay? If you exit some of your position and then it comes roaring back, well, then you have too small of a position to make it worthwhile, okay? And then you're, you're faced with all these other, too many decisions. And you got to boil it down. Like somebody once said, uh, we were talking about, I think it might have been like a covered call strategy. I was trying to explain to them, yeah, it sounds good on paper. You you buy the stock, and then you sell the call, and you make some income on the call, so to speak, income, haha. Uh, but what happens if the stock starts going down? Do you roll down the call? Do you buy in the call? Do you buy a put? Do you sell the stock? What if the stock drops like a stove? Do you, you know, it's, it's like before you know it, especially if you try to start, hedging it and buying puts and selling calls and buying puts and uh, selling calls close to red and buying Brian to spread it and all this other stuff. Before you know it, as this uh, gentleman said, it's like it's too many, too many moving parts, okay? So I think trading is hard enough without adding in too many moving parts. And then every time you add in a new decision, 
that creates a little animosity. And that's why I'm saying already have that uncle point in mind, which like a client emailed me ahead of time, which is great. And that's fine. I encourage everybody to do that. Um, they say, Dave, I'm going to stick with this position and I'm going to give it half a point. What do you think? I think that's a good idea. Okay. Uh, an extra half a point's not going to kill you on, um, I forget what the, where the stock was, maybe $15 a share or something like that. You already got the loss, an extra 50 cents. It's no big deal. Okay. Uh, next question. Is it a particular time of day that you place your initial purchase? No. Uh, there is a, a strategy in, in, in the IPOs that I execute, and I hate to say this, I don't want to give away too much, but I execute on the close, okay? Um, but for all of my core trading, okay, for the big winners and the occasional losers that I show week after week after week, there is no set time to trade. Here's the deal. If you say, I'm not going to trade during the first half hour, okay, let's say, Let's say the market opens. Uh, let's say the market opens here. Okay. Oh, I'm not going to trade the first half hour. Well, what if that stock goes up 20 points in the first half hour, and then you come in and say, "Okay, what's time to trade?" Well, it's already up 20 points. What are you going to do? Okay. So I think you have to take signals when they occur. Now, another 2.0 lesson or lesson 2.0. I mean, if a stock gaps. If you want to enter here and it gaps past your entry, it comes right back in. That's an opening gap reversal. You would avoid that type of trade. But the problem is, I think it's a bad idea to say, I'm not going to trade during this period of time. Now, I was on the phone yesterday with somebody who day trades, and they don't day trade the first half hour because they're looking for the spreads to close, and their execution is so critical. If they pay a wide bid-ass spread, then they're not going to be profitable. And, and I'm trying to encourage them to be more of an intraday position trader. I mean, they're not going to change their ways about being a day trader. But be an intraday position trader where you get in as close to that open and you exit as close to the close as possible and try to hold on for as much of the crux of the day as you can as opposed to going in and out all day or as opposed to going in and just for a little bitty piece. Oh, I got my little crumb. I'm going to run away. Okay. Nothing wrong with that, but you got to be careful. If your execution is that critical, then you got to really question your methodology. Okay. And I've seen people be fairly consistent and make consistent money by making little crumbs. The only problem is you get a little careless or something gets away from you. You can get a lot of, you can get into a lot of trouble fast. And, and let's not forget, they can still halt the stock intraday. So even if you are intraday trading, as a general statement, your risks are fairly small. But every now and then you're going to get whacked. The way I believe, what I believe about trading, and it's not my way or highway, but you always have to position yourself for unlimited gains and hopefully limited losses. And those occasional unlimited gains, when I say unlimited, I mean like three or 400% move, 500% or 600% even sometimes, is going to make your whole year, it's going to take care of a lot of losses, and it's going to keep you, it's going to really keep you in business, okay? It's going to make the whole venture worthwhile. Your shorter term gains and your smaller gains are going to keep the lights on, are going to keep you in business. But it's those real big home runs, although, they be, although they're kind of elusive, but you do set yourself up for those elusive home runs. So when they occur, you capture them, and that's where the real money is. So, again, you need to position yourself for unlimited gains and somewhat limited losses. And then getting back to the discretion thing here, by adding in that tiny little bit of discretion, that extra few cents, that extra 10 cents or 20 cents or even 50 cents, depending on what the case may be. I mean, if it's a high price issue, it might be a dollar or two extra, which is not going to be that big of a deal in the bigger scheme of things if you get stopped out at that extra dollar or two, okay? But that extra little bit gives you the potential to stick with something that could turn into an outlier, a big home run. Uh, something that's going to make your year. So outliers are key. So you want to try to stay with as many positions as possible by using a little discretion, but it's got to be within reason. You can't throw caution to the wind, okay? All right, lots of questions coming in. Fantastic.
good. This, is, this excites me. I like questions. All right. Uh, Jonathan says, with Zen, were there any MAs below the stop level that might have made it easier to hang in there? Oh, uh, I don't know. It's a new issue. So is the moving average even relevant? Um, uh, probably not. I mean, you're going to get into a moving average on a five-minute chart. you got to watch getting into that micro, okay? Dean says, I assume this doesn't apply for using hard stops. That is, that is correct, okay? Now, one thing I do talk about is I was talking with somebody yesterday, and they want to go out for a jog, and they're a little bit more shorter term oriented. But they like to go out for a jog or go out for lunch, and God bless them, you know, not so much a jog, but I do like to go out for lunch. I do force my fat butt to go walk. I, I try to get a couple of miles in every day, at least walking. I don't I don't run. It's too hard on a big guy like me. Uh, my knees will be shot in a week. Uh, but I digress. But I, I, the point I'm trying to make is I'm here about 12 hours a day in front of these screens, so I do try to get out a little here or there, try to take a break, try to walk away. And when the market's open, if I'm going to be away for a considerable amount of time, I'll make sure I have an airbag in place. So Gene's saying if you're using a hard stop, no, it doesn't work with hard stops. If you are new or newer to trading, and or you lack discipline, then you're going to have to use a hard stop and trade in a more mechanical fashion. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you could do so much better once you get the experience and or the discipline. I should say and the discipline. Or once you get the discipline, period. Then you can exercise some of these discretionary techniques, and you're going to find over the longer term you'll do much better. Now, you'll see a lot of times I'll show discretion here live uh, many weeks and a lot of times it just doesn't work. Well, let's say it doesn't work 10 times and your incremental risk adds up to several hundred dollars or even a thousand dollars. Kind of starting to add up a little bit. Let's say on a, let's say it adds up to a thousand bucks on a, on a 100k account. Well, let's say that 11th trade you end up sticking with turns out to be a 20 to 30 40,000 dollar winner. Then as you can see, it makes it all worthwhile. So that's where discretion could really pay off, okay? What about selling half, sell the remainder half? Yeah, no, we're gonna uh, no, Art, I covered that. Yeah, I think that's a bad idea. Too many, uh, too many transactions. Would you automate your stop entries and you place your stop at fourteen thirty as instruction? Then you can't use discretionary moves. That is correct. I am still in Zen, but I could see many automated stops where discretion can't be used. Yeah, yeah, Fred is uh, Fred's right. As long as you are using a mechanical stop or a hard stop, you cannot exercise discretion. Okay, and let me digress for a second. If we're in a rip-roaring bull market, then very little or no discretion is needed, okay? Put it a hard stop, you get stopped out, so what? There's, there's another bus coming along in two minutes, okay? In fact, that capital could be better put somewhere else, okay? You get stopped out, you get stopped out, just keep on going, but in anything less than a rip-roaring bull market, discretion is really necessary. It really makes all the difference in the world. I mean, the dead horse candidate I've been beating to death all year got he went down to the to the didn't even go below the stop, didn't even trade below the stop, but had a print or two right at the stop. So mechanically, it got stopped out, and then it went on to go up about 400 percent. From there, so you catch one of those a year. It's all you need by using a little bit of discretion. Art says, "I frequently get tangled up in my underwear." Oh, Art, are you in the right chat room? <laughs> I frequently get tangled up in my underwear when I start making discretionary decisions on a trade, and then I might end up with a serious wedgie. <laughs> well, you know what, Art, you got to know yourself, okay, and you have to embrace yourself. I'm going to do, I've talked about this before. I did an article for Traders Magazine. Um, it's, in, it's in the States here, I think, in digital form, but it's, a, it's about a half a million people uh, worldwide read it. It's a pretty, pretty big uh, publication. Check it out if you get a chance. Uh, T-R-A-D-E-R-S Magazine. And you can get digital versions here free in the States. But I did a, a, an article a while back for those guys, maybe six months ago, called it uh, doing the right thing. 
And I'm going to do a webinar next week for uh, festival traders, and I'm going to talk again about doing the right thing. And and a lot of times, what I've observed, and, and I used to be really guilty of it in the past, but me being out there as a public figure uh, has really helped me out a lot. I mean, like this morning, I had to make the decision, oh, geez, that profit target got away from me. What should I do? Well, you know what? I didn't get it perfect. I'm not going to let it erode anymore because it's like, like my wife tells me sometimes, if ever I get stressed out on trades or something, and I make the mistake of telling her when she walks in my office, she could tell, she, she could tell I'm stressed out. She says, well, what would Dave Landry do? All right? So I'm kind of stuck <laughs> into following my own stuff and knowing myself. So the point I'm trying to make is, a lot of times you know you're doing the wrong thing, but you do it anyway. And I'm going to talk about that quite a bit next week. It's some steps you can take to overcome that. But as long as you embrace yourself and know who you are and know that you have these weaknesses, then you can take steps to fix them. So like Art says, when he starts introducing discretion, uh, you should be like the, the client I said talked about earlier. You can say, hey, look, getting close to the stop. I'm going to give it an extra 50 cents. What do you think? Like, yeah, it's a good idea. So just say, okay, if I have to be faced with a discretionary decision, this is what I'm going to do. So it's almost like you need to make that decision ahead of time. One big problem that comes with discretion is, like I said, people just let it blow through the stop and keep on going. That's not discretion. That's throwing caution to the wind, okay? And when you do that, you're failing to face reality. You're not wanting to make that, um, what word am I looking for? You're not willing to admit defeat, which in trading you often have to admit defeat unless you, you want to stay in business, okay? Uh, and that's where, where I'm going with this is if you plan, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, okay? So... You have to follow your plan, and as I said a while back, the reason people can't follow their plan or even make a plan is because as soon as you make a plan, you admit the fact that you might that there might be failure because you have a stop loss in mind, and you're going to follow that plan, and you're going to take that stop loss when it is exceeded, given a little discretion if you're a little bit more disciplined, okay? So, Art... Um, just when you go into a trade, like I say, obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. Just say, okay, my stop's going to be here, and if the time comes, I'm going to give it X amount of wiggle room. So you have all these parameters in place already, and then you do it mechanically. It's it almost You exercise discretion mechanically, if that makes any sense, okay? And it's like sometimes I have to force myself to physically do something and then think about it later. It's like... Don't sit here and watch that profit erode and hope it comes back. Take it, okay, and then deal with it. Then think about it all you want later. So you really have to know yourself and, and, and follow uh, what you should do and, and know that you might have some bad habits that are, that you're, that are hard to shake and that you have to uh, embrace and deal with, okay? Hello, intraday or stop or end of day stop, intraday stop, okay? Because, again, a lot can happen in one day, all right? A lot can happen in one day, so you can't wait till the end of the day. You can wait till the end of the day to get in a position if that's the type of system that you're trading, calling for a market on close type of entry, okay? Uh, but if you have a generic setup like one of my setups with a decor methodology, then you're wanting to get in when the trigger triggers, whether it's on the opening tick or at the close of the day. But you certainly can't wait all day and hope that a stock will come back because something bad could happen. And selling could beget even more selling. Okay, intraday stop or end of day stop. My answer is different. If you can check prices intraday are totally unavailable. If totally unavailable, use a hard stop and no questions. If one is able to look or check prices, I would give it to the end of the day. And if it did not recoup, 
and close better than the stop sell, no matter what, unless it's above stop and not buy a penny. Um, well, Howard, any time you say you're going to give it an entire day to work out, if it's not working out, you can really get in a lot of trouble. So what I would suggest is maybe, you know, maybe trade with an airbag. And an airbag stop, and I, I borrowed that term. I think the book is Trading Chaos. I, I don't remember being a fan. I shouldn't say this in case um, this guy shows up at one of these webinars, which he probably won't. Uh, if, you talk, if you're preaching trading chaos, you would not be a trend follower and believe in what I say. But I did like the term he used, airbag. I think that's a great uh, thing for a stop. So an airbag stop, let's say you, you're – your normal stop, you know, in this particular case, your normal stop is here, okay? Your uncle point might be down here somewhere. Or an airbag might be way down here or further down there. And it's going to hurt if that gets hit, but it might just save your life, okay? If that type of trade goes against you, would, would that be a crummy trade? Um, what do you mean, Don? I'm not, you lost me. Dave, what happens if you need a position based on your methodology a few days later, the volume dries up completely. How does that affect your strategy? It doesn't do anything. If they come out with earnings, I don't care. Okay. If they do whatever, I don't care. If, uh, some bozo goes on CNBC and screams about the stock, I don't care. Okay. I don't care. I don't care. Now, his point is we enter a stock that has good volume, and then all of a sudden it dries up, it becomes thinner. In general, the stocks we trade have enough volume to where that's not a problem. But admittedly, I could see as I've been trading more and more IPOs, uh, but you can do this as a private trader. You can't do it as an institution. You can trade some of these thinner IPOs. But, yes, yeah, sometimes the volume does dry up. But you don't take new action when that occurs. You continue to follow your plan. Obsess before you get into trade, not afterwards. And stuff happens afterwards, or it happens. And that's spelled with a silent SH. Okay? Stuff happens. And I think we all know that here. Okay? So, no, don't start reading into things like, oh, the volume dried up. I should exit. Oh, they're coming out with earnings soon. I should exit. Oh, it, it, it. Because by the time you do all that, you're just going to make yourself nuts trying to think about all that. I know someone who uses a 5 ATR as their airbag stop. Well, it all depends on what average true range they're using, if it's a shorter term average true range or a longer one. But, yeah, that's a pretty big airbag stop. The only problem is you have to be careful not to the old commodity average, eat like a bird and defecate like an elephant, okay? If you are... Let's say the market is uh let's say the market's up here and your stops well let's put it on daily chart maybe. Okay. You know, let's say that the market let's say you're gonna get it here and you could have a stop here and you're gonna take profits here. Okay, so you're gonna make you're gonna make this much and you're gonna risk this much. That's where you gotta be careful. But if an airbag is just in place in case something really bad happens over a short period of time, that's okay. Okay, and that one or two times you get whacked, you could live, provided that you have the potential to make unlimited gains. You always need to have the potential to make unlimited gains. Now, some day traders might argue with me, well, if I'm only risking 10 cents and I can make 20 cents, and, well, you just scrape it along, scrape it along, scrape it along. Eventually, you're going to get a little careless or something's going to happen, or you might have to go to the bathroom, Okay. <laughs> And something might get away from you, all right? It happens. So the only way for me to trade is to make sure I have that occasional chance. Uh, well, well, I have a chance on every trade, I should say, okay? But it only happens occasionally where you have that virtual, nearly unlimited gain, where something just goes up a ridiculous amount. And that's where your year is going to be made. And that's important. And, and I think regardless of the methodology, it has to be skewed so much to where your losses are, are fairly small and almost minuscule and your gains are extremely big. Now, you can't just say, well, I'm going to take a three-to-one profit or something like that. I did a whole webinar just on that. That sounds wonderful on paper, 
okay? I'm going to take profits at three units, and I'm only going to risk one. Well, that sounds like a great trading system. Unfortunately, that market is three times more likely to make that one unit move, three times more likely to move one than it is to move three, okay? So let's say you're risking this and you're trying to make that. Well, this is three times more likely. So you're going to get stopped out three times as much just, just through this money management. And I'll just pull a number out the air. It would probably be like 75% if you added it all up. So you're going to, you're going to get stopped out. There's a 75% chance you're going to get stopped out trading this, this type of system alone, unless, you, unless your timing is just the most beautiful timing in the world. Uh, but what you can do is you can trade a system that looks like this, where the top end is open-ended, okay? Dave, seems like the odds against the unlimited gain potential happening in a sub-$5 stock are astronomical. For this reason, do you ever get a look at those stocks? Yeah, no, no, no. Every now and then, it's, it's not astronomical. In fact, the one I keep talking about, the one I beat the dead horse on, is SBWR, and it triggered at 550 It was just right around $5, so I don't know if that gives you the complete argument. But it triggered right here, okay, right around 5 bucks a share. The reason I liked it was because it came down from like 80 bucks a share or something like that, bottomed out, had all kind of patterns in it, and then made a beautiful rally from there. So I wouldn't rule out a stock because it's cheap. Now, if it goes below a dollar, I probably would ignore it. But if you've got a, a – we had a uranium stock many years ago, like a buck and change, and we went after it again last time. It didn't work last time, but the time before, it was a buck and change, and it was set up, and it had a tremendous amount of volume, and the thing took off. It went to the moon, okay? Stops are safety dead. Don't pay the bridge without a safety dead, and don't trade stock without a stop. I agree, okay? Now, it's the execution of that stop was what I'm talking about. So have a stop, and that's why I always say honor your stops, honor your stops, honor your stops. But if you're a little more disciplined, honor your stops, maybe give them a little bit more room if something just kind of bounces off of your stop and takes off again, okay? Dave, is it justifiable to use discretion on entries just as you recommend stop mix? Uh, well, um, not necessarily, okay? Because you're possibly, before I read the rest of your question, you're possibly introducing a level you're, – you're introducing more decisions to the process. Yes, discretion does introduce more decisions, but either you're in or you're out when it comes to getting in, okay? So if this is your entry and the stock hits that entry, you're in, okay? If it doesn't hit it, you're out until it does. Now, you don't want to come in here and say, oh, it hit the entry. Uh, is it going to keep going? Oh, there it goes. There it goes. There it goes. There. I better get in. Oh, I better get in. I better get in. Oh, I think I missed that trade. You know, now what do you do? Okay. But, yeah, I mean, I guess if you – now, I do have a setup called second entry pullback where you have a market that does this and that does this. Now, let's say you did miss this entry. Well, then you can you take a second entry above that. That's, a, that's what I call a trend pivot pullback or a second entry pullback, okay? But you don't want to trade this in and of itself. You want to trade the pullback first, and then if you happen to see a stock that does this, fakes out, then you can take that trade. But the problem is you don't know if your fake out might turn into this. So that's where you don't want to add any more discretion to your entry process. And again, you want to keep it simple. You want to reduce it down to its utmost essence. So if you're getting in, you're getting in. Now, if it gaps through your entry and comes back in, that's another discretionary technique where you would avoid it. That's an opening gap reversal. We talk about that all the time. Okay. Sometimes a stock nicks my entry, but then it crisscrosses or drops precipitously. Why not have a knuckle point on both stops and entries? Um, I think you're adding complexity to the equation when you do that uh, because the problem is, as I just said, Let's say that let's say that it hits that entry, comes in, and then takes off again. Let's say that's an intraday chart, okay? Uh, there's a chance that it could get away from you. If it hits your entry, then it hits your entry, okay? I hear what you're saying, but I think you're risking you're risking missing an outlier, okay? And 
hopefully your analysis is so good with this setup, your analysis from this point backwards is so good that if you get triggered in, if this thing triggers in, then it should work, okay? I don't think you want to add the extra layer of sitting there and watching it mess around the entry because you've got a bigger picture pattern working for you. You've got a bigger picture trend working for you. There's, you've got all these things I've obsessed obsess about. Like I said, with that, when, when we, we picked apart that little stock we just talked about, you had this massive, massive base. And then you had a bow tie. And then you had a huge rally off the of lows. You had everything working for you. And a lot of times what can happen, and let's say this is a daily chart right here. A lot of times what can happen is it'll trigger, come back in, and if you sit around and wait for that second entry, sometimes that following day, let's redraw it. Let's say it triggers. Sometimes that following day it's off to the races, okay? And if you wait around for that, you might just miss the boat, okay? Let's see if we can go back and see. Now, this isn't going to be a perfect example, but this thing took off a few days after it didn't work out right away, okay? So let's just let's just take a look at this stock, okay? So it's like, well, it just kind of nicked my entry down. You know, let's say that it nicked your entry back here and you decide I'm not going to take it. Then you come in and this stock gap's open to here. What do you do then, okay? It's like now you've missed that trade. So if everything kind of lined up going in, and you've got your entry far enough away to avoid noise, then follow that plan and don't try to figure out a way to avoid a trade. Just follow the plan. I view that differently than if you're already into a trade and sticking with it through discretion, okay? But I hear you, James. I mean, you know, it's good that you're thinking about this, these kind of things, but I, I think that make a plan to where your plan doesn't have I'm going to get in at 10, but if it hits 10, it comes back in, then I'm not going to get in. It, you know, before you, Because the problem is you need to think of the psychological problems that you can create for yourself. I'm going to get a little deep here just for a second. Okay, I'm in the business of taking risk. You're in the business of taking risk. Okay, We put capital in harm's way. That's what we do. Okay? Sounds kind of grandiose and it sounds kind of brave, but it's really quite boring if done properly. And occasionally a little exciting when it works out. But I'm willing to put that capital at risk if I see A, B, and C, okay? If I see the nice trend and a setup and I have an entry at a certain point. So I put that whole plan together and I'm willing to put that capital at risk if that entry triggers, okay? Now, this is where we get a little deeper on you. You need to think about what's going to happen psychologically to you if you micromanage yourself out of that entry and you've done all this analysis that suggests the stock could go to the moon and you don't take that entry and you come in tomorrow and that stock is up 10 points, okay? You know what I would do? I would drop some F-bombs. I would cuss and fuss. I would throw a temper tantrum like a little two-year-old. I would be pissed off. It would ruin my day. It would ruin my week. It might even ruin, it wouldn't ruin my year, but I'd be pretty mad, and I'd be pretty angry for a long time. And while I'm mad and angry, I probably wouldn't be too good at doing my analysis, and I probably would miss another big winner. And then I'd realize, well, wait a minute, I thought I saw that stock a couple days ago. Damn it, I was so pissed because I didn't take this entry. It's like psychologically it could wreck you. If you start micromanaging yourself out of viable positions before you even get into them, okay? So that's the way I feel about entries. Now, maybe it's hard for you to wrap your head around that because, well, but Dave, aren't you saying stay, you, aren't you putting a little discretion to stay with the position? Well, that's different. We're trying to catch that outlier. And you don't want to micromanage yourself out of the outlier, but you do want to use some discretion to keep yourself in that potential outlier. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense.
Do you want to make money or do you want to be proven right is either or not both. Yeah, I mean, that's the big deal, too. You know, we all have a need to be right. I mean, that's freshman psychology, rears his ugly head. Didn't Maslow or someone talk about that? We all have, we all want to feel good. We all have egos, okay? And we all want to feel good. We all want to be right. But sometimes being right and making money are two different things. And um, I guess there's a minor reward in that if you micromanage yourself out of an entry on a position and it doesn't work out, you get that small victory. You are right, but you still didn't make any money on the thing. You might not, you might have saved losing some money, but longer term, you're going to miss more of those winning trades. Now, again, I'm saying that you've obsessed to a point where you have the mother of all potential trades on, okay, or could be the mother of all trades, and you're doing that, then that entry is not so crucial. I mean, if you have a good spot to get in, then you just take it because you've done enough analysis that suggests that the stock can take off both on a short-term and a longer-term basis. Uh, again, let me just wrap this up real quick. I know there's a lot more questions. We've got a few more things to cover. Um, I didn't think we'd go this far in it, long in this, but I'm, I'm having a blast doing it, so this is great. Uh, again, it's, it should be viewed as incremental risk, okay? You get a risk this much more, not this much more. You're not throwing caution to the wind. Again, outlier is the key. I think we've uh, beat that dead horse. Catch one and you pay for them all, okay? One is all you need. Um, now, embrace the loss, okay? And this is where don't live in never, never land. Say, oh, my stop got hit. That is a loss. I am willing to take that loss, okay? I got that loss. Now what, okay? You want to see if you can improve upon that situation. Um, my life got easier, and I'm not sure exactly when I started doing this, but it's sometimes as I became an adult, and you think about what's the worst could happen, and what would happen if the worst happened, and the next thing is what could you do to improve the situation if the worst happened, okay? So think about the loss. Embrace, don't think about the loss. You have to embrace the loss. The loss is real, but is there a way you could, is it just a stop, Nick, or is it the beginning of something bigger? And your Uncle Point is going to tell you that. So again, 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 do not throw caution to the wind. Have an Uncle Point, okay? Now, try to wait a minute, or 5 or 10 or 15 or 30, but with respect to your Uncle Point. So don't just, don't just bail out if it's hit. Try to hang with it a little while longer to see if it's going to reverse right around that stop. The other thing, too, trade off the daily. If you go back a couple slides here, okay, this, this is not that big of a deal, okay? You can barely see it on the chart, okay? On an intraday chart, this is a little scarier. That looks like the end of the world, okay? That's why a lot of day traders kind of go nuts is because they just they watch every little tick, and it always seems like the, the end of the world. Speaking of watching the screen, do not stare at the screen all day, okay? Use some alarms. I keep a loose eye on the screen because I'm fascinated with markets because I'm here anyway, uh, but I resist the urge to act upon what I see, meaning to, to pull the slot. Who was it, Sakoto? Someone said having a quote screen on your desk is like having a slot machine on your desk. You want to just keep feeding it, and you want to be careful not to do that, okay? Uh, the question earlier, I guess I should have said this first, you have to use middle stops, obviously, and not hard stops, and airbags might be necessary, okay? I suffer from the melody of when I stay with the position that's bounced off a stop, and then I get out for minimal profit, if not break even, only to watch it take off without me. How do I stop myself from doing that? All right. Here's the beauty. I mean, this is this is next week's lecture that I'm doing for Festival of Traders. You know what you're doing wrong, but you do it anyway. So he's saying he gets stopped out, but then he micromanages himself out of position at the worst possible time. Okay? So let's say he's in a position. He's feeling pretty good. Oh, begins to sell off. He's got to stop right here. It nicks the stop. He exercises a little discretion, and then it takes off again. But then he exits it right here. Okay? Well... You don't 
stick with a position to have it come back a percent or two and then bail out. That's not what we're doing. Now, if it's if you're in something and it and it's a it implodes like this, it gaps down or something, and then reverses, okay, and you can improve your exit. That's fine. That's these are this is two different things. This is this is already blown up. It's done. Okay. This still has potential. Okay. It might just come down and kiss a longer term moving average goodbye, and this thing goes to the moon. So you know how you stop doing that? Stop doing that. That's how you stop doing that. All right. I know, easier said than done. But if you are fortunate enough to stick with this position, okay, then okay, that's my new stop. That is my new stop. That's where I get out. If it keeps going higher, then you start trailing that stop higher. Okay, your your longer term your longer term stop will start looking like maybe like a longer term moving average at that point in time. Okay? And if it comes down and nicks that moving average, then you have a discretionary decision if you want to make it to make whether or not you can try to stay with it. But don't feel like if the market comes back, oh, it's let me off the hook, I'm going to get out. I was in a webinar a while back. One of the clients called in and said, uh, I've been in a stock for two months. It just got back to break even. I exited it. And I'm like, that's the stupidest thing ever to do. Well, you know, what are you, you playing, you're playing for zero? You stayed with a stock two months? And as soon as it got to back to break even, you exited it? No, stay with it. If you stay with it for two months, stay with it for two more months. It's actually starting to do what it's supposed to do. Okay? <laughs> we were talking to somebody earlier. I often use the employee analogy, and somebody emailed me earlier. It was, it was pretty good. They, they use a the children analogy, too, and the employee analogy, which I thought was pretty good. And they were saying that um, when they first started trading, they were using their uh, – they treat their stocks as uh, – as I think it – was, is it you, Greg, or I have to look at the emails. I forget who it is. I get so many emails. But anyway, he said when he first started trading, he treated his stocks as children. And, and it's almost like he had this relationship with him. Like, oh, come on. You could do it. You could do it. He encouraged him to, to do better, to do better and stick with him and whatever. And then when he finally learned to trade, he began to treat them more like employees. And that's the argument I often give. I'll say, you got a guy that's busted his butt, and you got two guys that's sitting around on their butt, okay? Are you going to fire the guy that's busting his butt because you're thinking he's no longer going to bust his butt and then magically these two guys are going to start working? No, okay? So treat them like employees. Now, I know I'm kind of flipping flopping on you, but if you had a stock that's just getting back to break even after you, you, you've toughed out the tough times, maybe it's done. Maybe the tough times are gone. Maybe the consolidation is over, and now the stock's taken off. So you're going to quit after the 50-yard line, and you're never going to get anywhere by doing that, okay? Provided that your original plan was to stay with the stock. Now, if you just got the stock and, and, and you had no plan, then you shouldn't be trading from the beginning. That's a that's a whole different argument, okay? But it just to, not to beat you up too bad on this, Jonathan, uh, but just remember you're playing to win. You're not playing to, to get your money back. And I know it's hard when you got guys out there like me that are preaching money management, money management, money management, don't lose, try not to lose, don't lose, don't lose, don't lose, don't lose. But you have to kind of take an aggressive standpoint. And as I've said before, you kind of have to be a greedy bastard, and it's never enough. 400% is not enough on a position. 500% is not enough. Is 1,000% enough? No. Maybe 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 percent. You want to make as much as possible because there's always a chance you could lose money. So you have to make hay when the sun shines. And if you quit at break even or slightly thereafter, you're never going to get anywhere. Okay? So you plan your trade and then you trade your plan, and that's how you do that. Okay? TC 2000 alerts are great. They really are, they're fantastic. You get an email, you get a voice. Um, I, I don't use the, because I've, I've only had really had a cell phone with texting uh, last year or so, but uh, I, I, don't, I think you can get an SMS too, okay? Yeah, Jonathan, the answer there is plan your trade, trade your plan, okay? And then let's say you do take this, uh, you stay with this position during a stop, Nick. Just tell yourself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with this one, okay? And I'm not going to try to micromanage myself out. 
And there may be times where if you don't have the discipline, you might have to put in hard stops, okay? And you might have to let the market take you out. And then maybe if you did stick with that, maybe use a little bit looser stop just to ride out the noise and use a hard stop and then just follow your plan. And the beauty is once a position starts working really well, 99.99% .99 of the time, there's nothing to do. And also, by the way, I, I preach discretion, 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 discretion. But here's the deal. It doesn't happen that often, okay? Now, that's like two examples. There's going to be another example that's going to happen, that's happening right now. But that's, that's the exception and not the norm. From what I've seen, usually maybe once a quarter, the way I trade, a little bit of discretion is necessary and uh, makes all the difference in the world. I only remember talking about discretion twice, I think, in this last quarter. Okay. Okay, well, Howard, we'll get to that on the individual, individual stock questions. What about a rule that states you put your stop one tick below the previous entry bar? Well, if you're going to be within one tick below a bar, you're pretty much guaranteeing yourself to get stopped out. Uh, let me just finish up these slides real quick. We'll get back to these questions, and then we'll uh, hop into the overall market. Um, as you may or may not know, I've been uh, – that's the stupidest thing in the world. I just realized how stupid that sounds. You may or you may not know. Well, <laughs> it's either one or the other. But I think as many of you know, I'm going to do an IPO webinar real soon. I'm pretty excited about this. In fact, I'm really excited about it. And it's some great stuff. And um, – just a couple things I want to that I'm very excited about. Uh, one thing I've observed and have uh, capitalized on is often within the first week or so of trading, you get either a significant high, okay, and the market does that, or you get a significant low, and the market does that. And that's a wonderful thing about IPOs. And they either work or they don't. And here's a case where it's like they work. You get a nice little breakout type of entry. I know, I know, I've got a breakout pattern that I actually use in IPOs. I know I'm anti-breakouts, but IPOs are a bit different character, and I think you can trade that. I think you can trade this pattern here, okay, without giving away too much. You know, that's your takeaway from this week. Your significant higher lows often set in the first week of trading, and again, they either work or they don't. They work or they don't, and there's some very simple things you could do with IPOs, especially if you wait about at least a week and then analyze them and look for specific patterns. And even if you, you, you don't know the exact pattern that I'm using here, you could say if you waited a week in an issue like this, there'd be no reason to buy it, okay? So there's your takeaway right there. They either work or they don't for the most part, okay? And that's what two of the main patterns is they work or they don't. And those are bigger picture patterns. And here are some of the patterns that uh, I'm using. I'm putting together the, the spreadsheet for um, the marketing spreadsheet. Now, I know it's marketing, and I, I hate marketing, believe me, but, um, you know, I got to thinking. It's like you build a better mousetrap, and the world will be the path to your door. Well, that's not true. You've got to have to actually begin to market a little. So even though I've never marketed before, I'm going to have to start marketing. Uh, anyway, otherwise nobody will show up. But what's kind of cool is if you go in and take a look at these IPOs in here, and some of these you recognize from the trading service, okay, um, they've made some pretty good moves from the entries off of these patterns. And what's kind of cool is the max loss in these, and this one's a little volatile, even though it's 10%, that's really nothing considering the volatility of this stock. But notice that most of these losses from the entry are minuscule, and the IPO took off. And all of these are fairly recent IPOs. This isn't from 10 years ago. And then all of these are fairly recent IPOs that just absolutely failed. PBPB being one of them I just showed you, okay? And it's down 50% almost and counting. And you can avoid these big losers. So if, there's your takeaway. Even if you don't come to the webinar, they either work or they don't. And that's one good thing about them. And if they don't, there's uh, patterns you can avoid. Uh, one thing we talked about last week, I don't want to talk about it too much, but the big picture pattern number two that I've observed over and over is what I call a fly and die. And what happens there is you have this enthusiasm 
which carries through a little bit. You might have some, I hate to say it, manipulation, okay, that keeps the prices higher. And then the enthusiasm of the public gets kind of sucked in, okay. So the price begins to rise, and all of a sudden that enthusiasm begins to wane and reality might set in, okay, or, be, or reality does set in. A little sardine example of we're trading these stocks. We're not falling in love with them. These aren't our children. So this fly and die pattern occurs quite often. The beauty of it is you can make a lot of money in the fly phase on a lot of these IPOs before the die occurs. Now, you will have to have some money management to get you out when the die occurs, and I will talk a lot about this. This is an example I used from last week. This is the AERI we talked about earlier, and they had these are four of the patterns that I've observed. It, it ha actually had all four of them in the fly phase, and then it died. Okay. Now, sometimes they fly and fly, and that's beautiful. And that's the ultimate goal. But the reality is, the reality is pretty damn good. The reality is, a lot of times you get a fly and die. And a lot of times you get a die and a die. Okay? So if you come back to these, these so far have been fly. And you might have had a few fly and dies in here. And these have just been die and die. Okay? So that's the beauty of that. They just go down. They go down and they go up, but they don't go up forever. So it's not it's it could be a fairly short term gain, but it could be a wonderful gain. And then the ultimate goal again would be capture one that just keeps going. Okay. Uh, one more, like I said last week, uh, the breakout strategies can work quite well. Very simple strategies. When you see how simple you are, you're gonna say no, it's too simple, it won't work. But they do. And but one thing that will happen that can happen, I should say, is market conditions can dictate. So if you are printing money with these breakout patterns, and that's great, but if you start losing uh, in a series of trades, what you probably want to do is you want to back off again and go back to something more generic like a pullback or some of those other patterns that are pullback in nature as opposed to trading those breakouts. Okay. Uh, right now, even though things have been choppy in the overall market, the breakout patterns have been working pretty good. So far, so good. And again, money management is key. The most common pattern, one of the most common patterns is the fly and the die. You want to buy the fly and you want to exit before the die, okay? Okay, um, just some random thoughts. Pretty much the same thing from the last couple of weeks. Take things one day at a time, and especially in this particular market. Um, last two days, I saw a drastic turnaround in the overall market. doesn't mean that's going to keep going. But I saw a big turnaround. Things looked a lot better. But continue to just chip away at it. And we'll take a look at the market here in just one second. And listen to the database. Let the market tell you what to do. Let the market come to you. I haven't seen any setups lately, but that's normal because the market is making some new highs. And then continue to play a good offense and be very selective. If you can't stand it, then take the trade. Um, and, again, take, take the, um, trade the best and leave the rest. Uh, just an FYI, stock selection webinar on, check my website out for more on that. Uh, it's about 14 hours total, and then we um, we did have some pretty good scores in here. And look, one of these guys in the IPO, we had some pretty good scores in the uh, from the webinar that came out of it, so that was kind of exciting. You put some work out there, and it's a little scary, you know, you're like, oh, God, I don't want to bomb. But luckily, it worked out pretty good. So if you are interested in the IPO webinar, it's going to be on the 12th. Uh, anyone who buys a stock selection webinar gets in free. Anyone who has bought the stock selection webinar this year will get in free. Um, what I've taken is I've taken the IPO research from the stock selection webinar, and I've expanded upon it, and it's about five times as much stuff that I already presented in the stock selection webinar. So originally when I said you would get it free, what I was thinking about doing was just taking that one little piece out of the webinar but it's grown exponentially from there, but you'll still get it for free. Uh, so I want to stick to my word on that. So if you want the webinar uh, for free, then you'll get it. Okay. All right, let's uh, hop into the charts. I'm going to rush through. I'm not going to rush through the markets, but it should just take me a minute, and then we should have enough time to get to you individual stock questions. Um, there's just a few things I really want to show you here. Let's take a look at the overall market.
There it is. All right, peas. All-time highs, okay? And then today, they're having a pretty darn good day, up a half percent and change. So it, they're accelerating new highs, and that's a good thing. Uh, my concern was that they kind of begin to rally and stall it out a little bit. But then last few days, things have really changed. In fact, even this down day here, I think it was Tuesday, internally the market looked a little better. And this has been a market for quite a while where the internals just absolutely stunk, okay? But now it looks like things are improving. And as I've been saying quite a bit, when I see, when I see a breakout, I want the market to accelerate higher and not look back. And now we're getting a little bit of that acceleration today. So hopefully we'll get some follow through. And as I preach, follow through is key. Let's take a look at the quack. And the NASDAQ's got a ways to go, but it's not too far away from these multi-year highs. For me to get excited about this market, it would have to make it back to multi-year highs. Well, today's action is going to certainly help it get there, OK? Um, if a market is at 10-year lows and begins to rally off those lows, then I get excited about it because we could have a major trend change in the works. I don't get too excited about a major trend change that comes, comes off of high levels like this, okay? I would rather wait for the confirmation and see the market prove itself by making new highs. And the reason is you don't want to see it rally up and install out those prior highs and make a double top or a big head, picture head and shoulders or some sort of topping pattern and then roll right back over. Ideally, you want to see it take those highs out and keep on going. Like I said this morning, if this is the start of something new, then there'll be plenty of time to get long along the way. Now, my concern with the Russell has been that one, choppy downtrend, two, just a bit of a retrace up to kiss its 50-day moving average goodbye. But with today's rally, okay, if it all sticks, okay, then it's going to have a pretty good it's gonna be looking pretty good here ideally I want to see it make new highs too before getting too excited but almost it's almost up a percent and three quarters so that's a pretty good day and like I said one day at a time and last two days look really really good internally and that's why I wrote about that in the column and we talked about that in the service over the last couple of days and then now we're seeing some follow-through so follow through follow through follow through that could just keep on keeping on then I'm gonna be pretty excited about this market the semis have been doing pretty good in here Begging on new highs. This has mostly been a big cap affair uh, led by TSM and INTC, which make up, I think, 32% of this index. But it's new highs nonetheless. And then I'm starting to see some smaller cap, lower tiered technology begin to join in with them. So that is a good thing. Let's take a look at biotechnology. Biotechnology has improved last couple of days in here too, and um, this this is a little bit um, uh, older quote, but so far it is up nicely on the day. Health services banging out new highs in here, or have been banging out new highs in here. And then the other thing that's kind of cool is that these defensive issues, the utilities, those utilities look like they were rolling over, then they came all the way back up. This in spite of a bit of a slide in bonds, okay, you see bonds have been in a bit of a slide as of late. And utilities kind of hung in there, which is pretty cool. And other defensive areas, such as the energies, have hung in there. They haven't set the world on fire, but they've at least gone sideways and haven't imploded. And then the foods have also done well. My big concern was we had narrow, narrow leadership in these defensive issues only. And then they begin to kind of lose some momentum. So my big concern was unless some other areas come in and pick up that baton and carry it, okay, and run with the baton, however you want to, whatever phrase you want to use, then what's going to happen in the overall market when the narrow leadership dies and nothing shows up? The good thing is by not making a big picture prediction because, boy, I tell you, I was starting to feel like, oof, I might have to get a little bearish here. This thing looks like it could just absolutely die. And that's why we did go after a couple shorts. And uh, I think we got paid on one, but we're not getting paid much. And I think we're getting stopped on one as we speak. But it is what it is, and I think you have to go after those uh, shorts as they present themselves. You know, it's kind of interesting. I read a good quote in, uh, in Greg Morris's book, 
and it's from one of his colleagues over there at uh, Standian, um, where he runs like five billion bucks or something, you know, billionaire, billionaire, it begins to add up after a while. And he said something about, you'd have to, I guess he's talking about like a fund manager or something, but you need to question anybody's performance that has been uh, absolutely stellar over the last several years, like beating the pants off the market, because one has to wonder, and I wish I, I have to go get the book and, and, and read it to you, but the reason he was saying question is because they may have thrown caution to the wind. They may not have have taken signals that they should have, even though they didn't work out. In other words, when the market, let's take a look at like the S&P, or even the spiders will work, okay? When the spiders are doing this, you should be thinking about putting on some shorts, okay? And you should be getting knocked out of some longs. Yes, the market went straight back up. But how did you know that it was going to straight back up? You didn't, okay? In your FOS, if you thought you, if you say you did, okay? So and then even back here too, and even going back to 2012. So there are times when there are signs where you should be getting stopped out and exiting a market because it could be dying. And if you throw caution to the wind, then and just stay long all the time, that manager is going to get crushed. Okay, whereas this manager, this guy who started to get short during these times, he might even profit from a rollover. So uh, you, you just have to be careful uh, when it comes to markets. I'm not sure how I went on that tangent, but anyways, but things are beginning to improve a little bit. Uh, I guess the point I was trying to make, you don't want to get too bullish or too bearish, and you want to take things one day at a time. All right, let's uh, open it up for individual issues here. Uh, well, Don's here, and he wants to know about, guess what, F. Well, look at F. F is going up a little bit. It's got a mountain of overhead resistance back here. Uh, so I would never, I wouldn't buy the stock unless it got above this resistance and maybe set up. But I think the days are done for that being a. Uh, so Dave, don't apologize for marketing. You have something to say. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate that. Uh, BTCS and Jane, Gary's long that BTCS. BTCS. You must be BTCS. It's not in my system. Is that a penny stock? Wavex. Okay. Uh, this one's got, we talked about this one last week. It's got a mountain of overhead supply. I know it was a year or so ago, but I think it's still relevant. So the problem is it's going to run into that supply, and people might be looking to get off the hook. It's also pretty volatile. Look at the HV, 115. That's a pretty big HV. CMCM. CM, CM, cheat them. Um, my friend Rob Hanna, his wife's name is Cheatham, and when <laughs> they get introduced, it's kind of funny. It's like, here's Robin Cheatham. <laughs> um. I'm not seeing any structure here to go after um, without kind of picking it apart. So I must be. <laughs> oh, you'll get it. Don't worry. Don's wondering where is no P.S. Um, this stock is in a longer term uptrend. Uh, what did I say about it last week? Is it accelerating or not? It looks better this week than it did last week. You guys are asking about the same issues over and over again. I'm wondering if you're, uh, you must be long these stocks. Uh, it, it, it keeps going higher, but it seems like it's going higher with less vigor. Notice how it took off in here, and then it kind of slowed down. But, hey, it's still going higher. So if you're long, then just trail a stop higher and don't pick it apart. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. If you're not long, then I would not actually go after this stock. Just short, just look at a shorter term is all you really have to do. And you can see it really hasn't, it just kind of crawled above 15, okay? So for me to get excited, it would have to do more like that and then pull back, okay, to get excited about that one. S-U-N-E. All right, am I going to have to whip out Nicholas? Okay, this is a semiconductor, okay? Is that right soon? I'm guessing it's right, okay? Where is it now? Where was it 
back in March. So it's done absolutely nothing. Well, what are the semis overall doing? Or at least what's the SMH doing? SMH is breaking out, going higher. This stock is just going sideways. So I'm sure within semis, I mean, let's just take a look at the biggest semi of them all, Intel. Well, Intel is going up at least over the short term in here. So I think you could probably find something better in the semis to uh, keep an eye on. Pet them for Don. I'm going to have to whip out Nicholas. As a short, yes. Congratulations. Look at that. Don picks a stock. Hallelujah. And if you tell me you want to buy it, you're, you're, I'm going to kick you out of the group. Don, do you want to buy this stock? But, yeah, look at that. As a short, absolutely. Okay. Maybe too many days of the pullback. One, two, three, four, five. Let's not pick it apart too bad. Don finally gets a stock that's headed in the right direction. Okay. Or headed in one direction, I should say. But yeah, it looks like a possible short. Huge big picture top. That looks like a short. As you know, I, this is I'm gonna stop. Oh, man, I hate to give Don a high five. I'm tempted to give you a high five on that one. New one? No! I, I, you went from you went from a high five to nothing. Where is Nicholas? Let's find Nicholas. Let's get him out. Let's wake up Nicholas. Nicholas, what do you think about the stock? No. What are you thinking? It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's electrocardiogram. The electrocardiogram, electrocardiogram. We have one of those? Electronic, electro. Oh, here we go. Electrocardiogram. That's what electrocardiogram looks like. Okay. Uh, an uptrend looks like that, a downtrend looks like that, and that's what electrocardiogram looks like. Finally. <laughs> yeah, it's, it might be your last one today, John. WFM. <laughs> no! <laughs> what are you thinking? You got a big gap down? Uh, it's in trouble, but I wouldn't short. I mean, it looks like the damage is done. Okay. Um, no, it's done. Yeah. What do you What do you do with that? IDTI on a pullback. IDTI. Um, the only problem is it needs to be a little bit past its prior peaks in here. I like the way you think, though. Uh, these semis are doing well in here, uh, but it's got to clear this peak a little bit better. For me to get interested in it, look like that, and then a pullback. I hear you though. And this stock has been kind of like a wide and loose, but a but a box stock. It sort of makes a base, and then works its way higher in a sloppy manner. Makes a base, works its way higher. So one thing about my methodology is, unless you get a clean setup way back here, the methodology doesn't really lend itself to something that just kind of crawls along and chops along, I should say, and making these bases after bases. That stock we talked about a little while uh, earlier just kind of crawled higher. Unless you got a clean entry early on, then the methodology doesn't necessarily work for stocks to just kind of make bases on bases. But we've had stocks before that we've gotten into. Rice might be one of them right now, RICE, where we got in and on a really clean setup, okay, and then it might just be, it might just turn into a box stock. At least I hope it does. And it's kind of making, maybe it'll make a box on top of a box on top of a box, okay? So you kind of have a box, top of a box, you know, and then it just keeps doing that a la Nicholas Darvis style, okay? Um, I love the concept of Darvis. I just think it's a little bit hard to execute, and that's where my patterns come into play is that it'll get you into these stocks that can turn into these Darvis stocks, okay? V and W as a short. V and W. I didn't catch the name. I'm sorry. BMW. Um, I don't know if the right stock symbol or not, but it's too many days in the pullback. Remember, we're looking to trade pullbacks, so it would have to be, let's say, less than 10 days in the pullback. And usually, in the short side, I like to see things um, crack quicker. Long ENG stop at 20. 
the EMA. 28 EMA is probably going to be too tight. We've had this conversation many a times before. Um, but it can work, okay? If you get in some, if you get into something that's in a rip roaring trend, the 20 can work. As I've designed the system before around the 20, when you have daylight, as long as you have daylight, that's a trend, okay? Um, but I think a 20 EMA could be a little bit of a tight stop if you're longer term trend following or trying to get into longer term trend following from a shorter term position as we do. Okay. You're welcome, Phil. Phil gets again Phil's Phil gets in free. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I you can read my mind. You can't read my mind. Uh WFT. Um Phil was saying thanks on the webinar. Weatherford International, the problem with this stock is it's been kind of flat lately. You know, don't forget to draw your lines. And if you if you're not good at drawing lines, make sure you know, put you some um, linear regression lines in here. Okay, so that's your this green one right here is linear regression. This green one is my line. I'm just drawing across the tops in this particular case. So yes, it's worked its way higher, but it's taken it a month to go a point. So I would I would leave that alone. We're we're trend followers, and we definitely want some trend. Nasdaq reversed right up at the 200 day test. Howard, okay, let's take a look at that. A little bit quack. All right, 200 days. That's 500. Oops. I was playing. I was bored in a, um, in a meeting a while back, and I was playing with like the 500 day moving average in daylight, and that was kind of a fun thing to do. And you can do the same thing with 200-day moving average. As long as you have daylight, means that the lows are greater than moving average, stay long. Look at that. You caught some nice, pretty pretty decent moves in there. With a little money management, you could have done okay. So the NASDAQ has been above its 200-day moving average since 2013. Jeez, that's pretty impressive. So it's kind of fun to play around this kind of stuff, especially if you get bored. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the beginning of 2013. It stayed above, meaning daylight. The lows are greater than the moving average. And look at that little didn't even um didn't even didn't even touch it. So that's pretty cool. So yeah, it's fun to look longer term every now and then and see what's happening. So so far so good. I hear you, man. The only problem is sometimes you can't you can't let a market let's measure this. It's gonna be a little bit more but you can't let a major index now individual stock, yeah, but you can't let a major index go eight or nine percent or ten percent against you um, without taking some evasive action. And evasive action meaning just making sure you're honoring your stops if that occurs. Okay, T H E R or T N E R. Hit your caps lock so I can see my eyes are lo I'm losing it when I can't see anymore. T H E R. T N E R. Oh, T N E R. Yeah, I can't. Read. Uh, yeah, it looks good. You know, there's your breakout in an IPO, and there's another pattern that that triggered back here. It looks pretty good. Uh, yeah, so far so good. Now you got to wait for your next pullback, though. Okay. Fold. Did we talk about that one. Yeah, I don't see any reason to be in this stock here. Um. It's kind of it, you got a lot of overhead uh, resistance. It's, it, it's just all over the place, so that's just too crazy for me. Uh, PES, we talk about that one. Twitter, PES. Yeah, maybe on a pullback. Um, if you're long, stay long. But yeah, it's going to have to accelerate higher. Yeah, that one's going to have to accelerate higher. TWTR, Twitter. You know, here's another example of fly and die, okay? It flew and it died, okay? And there were patterns along the way to catch the fly, and then you avoid the die, okay? You just enjoy the ride. And there's a lot of those nice little rides up that can be um, uh, taken. Uh, Coop is another IPO. Coop's making new highs, or was making them recently, okay? 
Yeah, I, I want a little bit more of a pullback now. I mean, now it's becoming more. You got to realize that once the IPOs have been out for a while, they start to transition into more of the core methodology, and uh, especially those that come public at higher levels. Then I'm a little bit more. Um, what's the word? I'm less. I'm not as lenient on them. Okay, uh, because they're priced high enough to where uh, they're, they're priced a little too high sometimes. It seems like once they're above 20 or $30 a share, they come public around that area. You've got to be a little skeptical with them and then maybe wait for um, bigger picture patterns. But, yeah, maybe on a little bit more pullback, this one might be worth going after. Okay. Ideally, you want to catch them sooner than that, but... I hear you. Once once they're out for a while, sometimes it's still, you know, even when they're as, as old as a year or two, sometimes they can be worth trading. And that's something I'm going to touch upon. I call those toddlers. Uh, obviously, when they're that old, you want to trade more around the core methodology, but they can still they can still pan out. There's still some promise in them, especially if they've, they've uh, made it that long, okay? Okay. FRBK, FRBK, FRBK. Uh, no, it's too flat lately. Well, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, too many days of the pullback. Um, I hear you, though, but uh, way too thin. Yeah, look at that. Uh, way too thin to trade. I mean, you could do it as an individual trader, but just be careful. Wynn wants to know about five and Wynn, turn on your uh, caps lock. Normally, I'm telling people to turn off their caps lock. But if you're punching in signals, yeah, um, that could that could actually trigger soon. But I can't show you the pattern. <laughs> I know I'm a tease. Soon, oh yeah, we talked about that one. Uh, AMKR, yeah, look at that. That's beautiful. Yeah, on a pullback. I mean, you know, you got stocks that look like this, and then people are we got I'm getting asked not to pick on anyone, but just so you learn. We got stocks are being asked about look like this in the semis when you got stocks that look like this. This AMKR, just for S and Gs. Uh, let's take a look at the Landry list. This one has been in the list for quite a while. Let's just see what it's worth uh, to the list. I'm just curious. Just bear with me. AMKR. Yeah, it's up 57 percent. Since it went in. Now, the reason I'm, let me show you why I'm showing you this. It went in on 331. I think we talked about this last week. Um, it went in here, I think. Okay. And now it's here. So, the point I'm trying to make is momentum can beget momentum. So, in this momentum list, I track this Landry 100. Things go in as they're making new highs. Okay. And ideally on expansion of range. Now, I don't think you can blindly trade like that unless you're in a rip roaring bull market. But the fact that I'm trading 100 stocks, actually, actually that's a misnomer. I'm not actually trading these stocks. I'm making a portfolio as if I were trading them as like a fund, and I put 1% of the fund's assets into each issue, okay? Um, and that's how I track them. I track them on a VAMI basis. And this, uh, these momentum stocks get absolutely crushed when the market begins to roll over, and then I start putting in bond funds, and defensive issues to try to keep it afloat and whatever else that may be trending higher and then it stabilizes out and then when the market takes off again stuff like this AMKR which didn't get knocked out really makes it pay off uh, but it's a fascinating I would encourage you to track your own momentum list too uh, I use stock finder to actually do the calculations for me RDNT do we talk about that one there's two of you asking about this one of you guys already long yeah, I mean, it's breaking out, but it's going to have to keep on breaking out, okay, and then pull back for me to get excited about it. But, uh, yeah, not bad. WWAV. Oh, by the way, there's just not a whole lot of stocks that are set up right now, so that's why I'm not getting too excited about anything. Yeah, I mean, it's a food company. Well, it's pretty good for a food company. Uh, it's kind of all over the place. Uh, I see what you're saying, though. It looks like it's sort of – it's kind of got a box-ish – uh, stock or box stock look to it makes a box make a, makes a box maybe it's making a new box but it would have to accelerate higher at this point in time it's already closing at new if it closed here it'd be at new highs you have to accelerate higher okay 
Uh, AMKR was on your land list of 415 uh, and 416. Thank you, Phil, but I didn't take it. Can you remember why you passed on it too? Too many positions, perhaps? Yeah, Phil, it's, who knows what I was thinking back then. Um, uh, but, yeah, it was pretty beautiful. You said it was, it was probably on back here. Uh, let's see, 415. Let me see if we can, we can deduce what I might have been thinking. 416. Uh, let's take a look at the overall market on those days. 415, 16. Yeah, I mean, we were kind of like in this, in this choppy market here. Uh, you know, in hindsight, that would have been fantastic. It's like that, uh, what was that Chinese stock recently that I didn't put on as an official setup that just went to the freaking moon? Uh, it was this one right here, China Plastics, okay? So that was set up back here, but it just didn't seem like the risk was worth it. Well, in hindsight, that would have been a pretty nice trade, up about 100% from then, okay? Uh, like my wife says, at least it was on my radar. You know, I get a little aggravated when I miss them, but, you know, at least it's on your radar, and if conditions would have been better, I could have taken it. And here's the thing. I throw out a lot of excess research. I don't take every trade that I come up with, Okay. And CXDC or whatever the name is and the AMKR, they were both in my Landry list of setups. I did not personally take them, but some of you did. And that's one reason I do a trading service is I take uh, picks from my Landry list if the conditions are um, right. And sometimes there's these ancillary setups that are pretty good-looking setups. So, um, you know, again, you can't kiss all the women sometimes. So, uh this is why, you know, one reason I don't do a trading service. I throw off a lot of excess research, so that's fine. I'm, I'm glad you guys are doing well with them. Uh, BWP, defensive stock. BWP, oops. BWP, no, uh, no, because energies are, is this unadjusted or something? Let me see something. No. Uh, no, you got this big old fat gap down, okay? And even if it did rally, it's going to stall. I mean, I know it would be a good problem to have, but it, it's going to stall probably long before it hits that. You just want to make sure you have structure. And if energy overall is up near new highs, you don't really want to be bottom fishing. Unless you got the mother of all reversals and something that looks like it's, 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 it's time has come. But this is not the mother of all reversals when you got a big fat gap like that, okay? SPDI. Uh, I don't have that. SDPI. When hit your caps lock. I can't. My, my I can't read. I have to put my glasses back on. SDPI. <laughs> uh, yeah. I see. What, I see what you're looking at. Yeah, this would have already triggered with uh, on a breakout strategy. So wait for a pullback. Good eye though. Dave, what was I simply looking at before? FIV something like the way the chart looked, but it closed. But forgot the symbol. I don't remember what it was. FIV something? FIV. I don't remember. Well, the good news is we can look at the recording. Um, we'll go back to the tape. We'll check the recording out. We'll figure out what it was. Okay. Jonathan D., that's going to be a big fat stock. Probably not going to like it. It's going to be a chemical. No, I'm sorry. I was thinking DuPont. This is a, actually a utility. This looks like a short. I wouldn't short it, though. I mean, this is only a two-point move down, round numbers. It's 15. HV is 15. It's very low HV. But it does look like a top. I do hear you, and it also is a bow tie. And this was the action that concerned me. We started seeing some of these utilities roll over. We started seeing some energies roll over. We started seeing some foods looking a little questionable. And that was the only areas of strength in the overall market. Now the overall market has begun to improve, so I'm not so worried about these, okay? Rice is at 34. Yes, it is, Phil. And uh, start keeping an eye on that profit target. Heaven knows, God knows we could use one. We could use a winner or two. We had a really good streak, and then we got some stinkers. And then uh, rice looks like I might be our salvation in here. And then uh, the coffee stock might uh, help us out, too. But, yeah, uh, profit watch on rice. Absolutely, Phil. Thank you for doing that. Uh, Phil's going to start to look like a shelf. <laughs> K, oh, I can't read you either. Uh, KT, boy, the font is little on this. I should use the LE font because that's a that's a big font, but I don't know how to change it to the LE font. I IDTI in a pullback. Did we talk about that one? Uh, it's going to have to clear the prior highs decisively. I think we did talk about that one. Well, look, we're uh, right about the time where it gets tough to manage a recording, so let's go ahead and shut things down. 
I love the, doing these shows, as you can tell, and I just have a blast doing them. And I learn a lot in the process, so I appreciate you guys coming from a selfish standpoint. Thank you so much. And then I'm humbled that you would come here to listen to me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Any unanswered questions, shoot me an email, david, davidlander.com. Everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk again. And then I'll see you guys next week. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, check the, uh, by the way, check the newsletter. We've got a lot of webinars coming up outside of the ones that I do here, and they're all free. So uh, I've, I've got a busy schedule coming up. So check the newsletter next few days, and I'll, um, I'll be posting those webinars as they get close. Thank you so much.